Now we're going to begin looking at the specifics of the male reproductive system. So we'll entitle this first flowchart on that idea just that. Male Repro System 1. And these first couple of flowcharts on the male reproductive system will be all about anatomy. But again, remember, when we're studying anatomy, when we're studying physiology, both of those go hand in hand. Form and function are key parts of any system within human biology. So as we go through this system, I suggest taking a look at figure 46.9. You should be very familiar with this figure. You should be able to label this figure completely after understanding this lecture and be able to understand the specifics of each part of that figure and why each part does its job the way it does. Now, the number one thing to understand about male reproductive system is the function. Because everything about the male reproductive system is designed in some way, shape, or form to satisfy these functions. There are two major functions, essentially. We have to understand that first and foremost, spermatogenesis is our number one sort of function. And number one, I would say 1A would be spermatogenesis. Spermato meaning sperm genesis, birth, making sperm. That's a hugely important function that we have to keep in mind every time we look at any type of anatomical structure. How does that structure involve itself in this process? And also, what good is making the sperm if you cannot deliver the sperm? That's our second function. The male reproductive system, in, in addition to making sperm, delivers sperm, but we can be a little bit more specific than that. The sperm has to be specifically delivered for its purpose into the female repro tract. And that's something we'll look at in the next lecture, the specifics of that delivery and the idea of the female reproductive tract, but the delivery has to happen as well. So every time we look at any structure within this system, remember, ask yourself, how is it involved in spermatogenesis or how is it involved in delivering sperm? That's going to be critical in understanding the entire process of the male reproductive system. So let's go through the anatomy. The way that I've shaped this uh, ana anatomical look at the reproductive system is roughly the way in which sperm is delivered from the beginning, from its birth, all the way to its release and delivery eventually at the end of the reproductive, let's say, event that males undergo. So let's begin by first looking at the testes. That's our first structure to look at. So let's label this as testes. That's the plural. The singular of this would be testis. Okay. Now you may also have heard of testicle. That's going to be mentioned a little bit later. There's actually a specific reason why there are two different forms of this, testes versus testicle. Now testes is the correct form here. We'll get into the details of why. So testes essentially are the male gonads. They are the male structures that are going to be producing sperm. They consist of two substructures that are important to understand. So they're labeled in figure 46.9. I suggest looking at that. And they consist of both the seminiferous tubules. So seminiferous tubules. And also they consist of Leydig cells, which are intertwined within this structure. So seminiferous tubules are essentially very long and hollow tubes. Now, why are they long and hollow tubes? This is something you should be asking. Also, they have a tiny diameter, I should point out. What is the purpose of this? There must be a uh, functional reason for this type of structure. And that is because this is going to be our major site of spermatogenesis. So this is something to remember. I would absolutely put this to memory that the seminiferous tubules is the start of and the site of majority of spermatogenesis, of the birth of sperm. So that's our function here. That's definitely, definitely seen in the seminiferous tubules. In addition, the Leydig cells are really close to these tubules. They're actually right between the tubules. If you look at the figure, these Leydig cells are right there. And their job is to guide this process of spermatogenesis. Remember, every time I mention a structure, ask yourself, how is it involved in spermatogenesis or how is it involved in the delivery of sperm? How, is how are Leydig cells involved? Well, they're involved because they produce testosterone, testosterone, let me make sure I spell this right, there we go, testosterone and also other hormones, plus other hormones. So they're very much hormone secreting cells. Now, 
What is the purpose of this secretion? Well, first of all, the purpose would, of course, to be to guide reproduction, spermatogenesis. It's also involved in growth. T testosterone is highly involved in growth. Um, it's also involved in metabolism, the other hormones, let's say. So remember, it's not just testosterone. It's also other hormones. Um, homeostasis is also uh, sort of guided by the hormones produced by the Leydig cells and also behavior. So very much a lot of stuff going on in the Leydig cells, a bit of oxytocin, which is tied to behavior as we saw in the previous lecture. So there's a lot going on within this testes region. So that's our first sort of look at the male reproductive system. Major take home point, this is where spermatogenesis begins and is guided by the Leydig cells. So the seminiferous tubules is where we have the start of spermatogenesis and though most of spermatogenesis occurs here. And then later on, the Leydig cells also are influencing this reproductive capability of the testes. So that's our first structure. Okay, so now moving forward. So let's say we've made sperm. What's the next job? So we make sperm because this is where spermatogenesis happens. The next job would be to get to the epididymis. So let's do this. Um, let me do this line again. Let's do it over here. The epididymis. What do we do here? What is the purpose here? So epididymis. This is going to be, again, another tube structure. A lot of tube structures are going to be here. The reason why is because we're trying to make sperm and deliver sperm. And the way to deliver sperm is through a tube. You have a one-way tube, essentially, to deliver sperm. So we're going to be seeing a lot of tubes, interconnecting tubes, throughout this reproductive system. So it's something to keep in mind. So this is a coiled tube, very much uh, coiled. Now, remember, coiled structure increases surface area, so that's important here. What are the major functions of the epididymis? So... We have to remember, it's going to be involved somehow, some way, in either spermatogenesis or delivering sperm. Let's look at the functions. Here, we're going to have a critical sperm function that's going to be in charge of maturation. Sperm maturation happens here. The majority of spermatogenesis happens in seminiferous tubules, but in order for the sperm to really become successful and fully developed sperm cells, they have to mature. And the, maturation, the maturation process happens within this epididymis structure that's very close to the testes structure as well. There's two of these and two of these, okay? That's going to be a theme in much of the male reproductive system. The maturation process takes about three weeks, and the, the idea of maturation is essentially to become motile. Sperm are no good, they are not successful unless they are movable, unless they are moving, and in order to become motile, all of this has to happen um, within the epididymis maturation. And then, once you have become motile, you are going to travel through, I would say. You, you travel through the coiled tube into the next structure, which we'll get to. Now, in addition, because the sperm maturation happens here, let's say the sperm is matured. This is also going to be a place where, because you're maturing sperm here, you're also going to be storing sperm. So sperm storage happens here. It's a nice home for the sperm. It's a perfect environment for them to stay alive and continue their success for as long as they are needed. Um, and also, this is going to be the first site, let's say, of sperm transport. Because this is going to be a point at which sperm are going to be done, matured, fully ready, and they're going to be transported from this point onwards to the delivery process. Okay, so that's our epididymis structure, very close to the testes structure. There are two of these, there are two of these, um, and now we're going to look at now. The next structure is not necessarily the next part of the delivery of sperm, but it's an encompassing structure for the testes and epididymis because it's something that's worthy of protection. This is how reproduction happens. This is how sperm are made. So you have to make sure that you're protecting this area, the testes and epididymis, very much so, and making sure that the environment that's within these two structures is perfect. And the way to make sure that that's happening is through a scrotum structure. So the scrotum is going to be a sac. It's essentially a sac containing the following. It's a sac containing both the testes and the epididymis. So both testes and both epididymi, I think that's the plural of epididymis, are going to be within the scrotum encompassing sac structure. Now, an interesting point to note about the scrotum, if you look at figure 46.9, it's actually suspended from the groin. Suspended from the male groin region. It's not within the body. It's actually essentially outside the body. So we're going to say that the scrotum is, in all sort of purposes, it's technically outside of the body. And the correct term for that would be uh, descended. 
So a descended scrotum is present in male anatomy. Why is that? Why would something so, let's say, precious that harbors life itself, from the male side at least, be outside of the safety of the internal body environment? There's going to be an evolutionary mechanism behind this. There has to be a true and wholehearted reason to make this choice of a descended scrotum outside of the body. And that's because of the following reason. Remember, everything is about making sperm or delivering sperm. This scrotum structure is basically going to be there because the making sperm has to happen in a very specific way. And I'm just going to do this over here. What's going to happen here is that sperm cells... These things that will eventually fertilize and become in another organism upon fertilization, they don't, sperm cells, don't develop at body temperature. Develop at body temperature. Whatever it is, 98.6 degrees Celsius, um, or uh, 98.6 degrees Celsius, uh, and also 35 degrees Celsius, sometimes people say. It doesn't matter. Just remember body temperature. That's not how sperm cells develop. What they actually need they need it actually to be one to two degrees, just one to two degrees, the smallest of differences, cooler. That simple need of these sperm cells in their development is going to harbor the entire need for the scrotum structure. So because of the fact that temperature, the reason why it needs to be one to two degrees cooler, let's say, if you're thinking even further, temperature itself greatly affects the production and longevity of sperm production plus longevity of sperm. So if you have this high temperature of the body, let's say it's 98.6 degrees, even though it's only one to two degrees higher than necessary, the longevity of the sperm and the production of the sperm will diminish. It will diminish so much that it will actually be causing the organism, the human body, the human who is within this structure that's in question, let's say, will not be physically fit or will not be fit in the sense that they will not be able to reproduce successfully. So what's going to happen here is that you're going to have this scrotum structure that ensures that the testes and the epididymis, which are where sperm are made and mature and are stored, are nicely stored outside of the body's uh, 98.6 degree, let's say, structure. What they are actually going to be uh, developing in is something a little bit cooler, like 96.6 degrees Celsius, maybe. And that's necessary because this is the reason why you're going to have successful sperm production, because sperm need a perfect temperature. So, now, in addition, what we also are going to notice are some exceptions that we should label out because there are some exceptions to this rule. It's not just humans, but sometimes there are going to be organisms that do have internal structures in the testes and epididymis, and those would be things like elephants. Elephants do not have a descended scrotum. Elephants are going to actually have a low internal body temperature. So let's write elephants with naturally sort of low internal body temperature. Their internal body temperature is actually naturally 96.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And so um, whales also are part of this. They're going to retain their testes within their abdominal cavity. We as humans will not. And therefore, what's going to happen is we're going to have a scrotum structure. Now, the reason why there's also the term testicle is a testicle is something that, that it's a testes, but it has to be encompassed within a scrotum. So when we say testicle, we simply mean a testis one of those testes within a scrotum. When it's within the scrotum structure, that's referred to as a testicle. When it's looked at isolated outside of the scrotum, then we refer to as a testis, just in terms of terminology. And that covers our first look at the male reproductive system. Important to note that the scrotum structure uh, causes this descending of the scrotum and thus the outside nature of the testes and epididymis, both of which are highly involved in spermatogenesis.